I'm a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service. I have some stories to tell. Credited to Search and Rescue Woods. Part 4 Hey guys, I'm back from my training off, and I have a lot of really interesting stories to share with you. I've got enough that I'm going to break them up into two parts, this being the first. I'd love to put them all in one entry, but I just haven't had a chance to write them all down yet. I don't have anything too crazy happen while I was out there, but we did have one incident with a rookie that I found relevant. Since I'm sure you guys have been waiting for these, I'll just get right into the stories. I'll assign each batch of stories to the person who told them to me. KD is a vet who's been an SAR officer for about 15 years. She specializes in high elevation mountain rescues and is widely considered one of the best in her field. She was one of the more enthusiastic storytellers, and since we were together a fair amount during exercises, she ended up telling me about four that really stuck with me. The first, she told me in response to my asking about her most traumatic calls. She shook her head and told me that really bad calls happen more frequently on the mountain, since the potential for nasty accidents is higher. About five years ago, one of the parks she worked at had a string of disappearances. It was a bad year, she said, one of the worst on record as far as weather went. They were getting about a foot of new snow every couple of days, and there were a few avalanches that killed some climbers. They'd warned people about staying on the mapped areas, but of course, there are always those who don't listen. In one particularly nasty case, an entire family got wiped out because the father decided he knew better than the officials, and he took them out into an area that wasn't safe. They were snowshoeing, and as best as KD could figure, they walked onto a shelf of snow that looked solid, but actually wasn't. It gave way, and this family went ass over tea kettle almost 300 feet down a slope. They landed on the rocks at the bottom, and the parents died instantly. One of the kids did as well, but the other two survived. One had a broken leg and fractured ribs. The other was almost unharmed, save for some bruising and a sprained ankle. The uninjured child left his sibling behind and set out to find help. KD said the kid didn't make it more than half a mile before a storm overtook him. He stopped to try and get warm, or maybe just to rest, and ended up freezing to death. They ended up finding the family with the help of some witnesses who saw them heading out into the wilderness, and she was the one to find the kid who'd frozen to death looking for help. She said it had started to snow, just enough to obscure long-distance vision, but not enough to make searching impossible. She saw a figure sitting in the snow up ahead, and she got to it as quickly as possible. She described in detail how as she got closer, she realized first that it was a child, second that they were deceased, and third that they had frozen in one of the most pitiful positions she'd ever found a corpse in. The kid was sitting upright, with his knees tucked up against his chest. His arms were curled around them, and his head was tucked up in his coat. When she moved the coat to look at his face, she saw that he had died crying. His face was twisted, and the tears were frozen on his cheeks. She said it was painfully obvious that the kid was terrified when he succumbed to hypothermia, and as a mother, it broke her heart. She told me repeatedly that she hopes the father is burning in hell as we speak. The other traumatic story she told me that stood out in my mind was one that happened when she was a rookie. Her team got a report of an experienced climber who hadn't come home the previous day. His wife was convinced that something bad had happened because he never failed to come home on time. They went out looking for him and had to climb what sounded like some very technically challenging parts of the mountain. They got to a relatively flat area and KD started seeing blood in the snow. She followed the trail and as she went, she started seeing little bits of tissue. She wasn't sure exactly what body part it had come from, but the farther she followed it, the more there was. She follows this blood and tissue trail to a sheltered area under a cliff face, and she finds the climber. She said there was so much blood, more than she'd ever seen before. He was lying face down, one arm stretched in front of him, as if he'd died crawling. She looked closer and sees that he's been partially disemboweled, which is where the tissue had come from. 
The guy has an ice pick tucked into a hip holster, and it's covered in blood. Of course, they'll never be sure exactly what happened, but she said as best as she can figure, this is what went down. The guy had been attempting to climb up to the next area, and had been using his ice axe to ascend. He'd probably hit a loose patch and had fallen. On the way down, or possibly when he landed, he'd gotten impaled by the axe, and it had disemboweled him. He'd drug himself along, tearing pieces of himself out as he went, and had died under the cliff face. She isn't terribly bothered by gore, but I guess a few of the guys who came to help her remove the body threw up when they turned him over and a good portion of his intestines spilled out. I mentioned to her that I was interested in hearing about any experiences she had with people completely disappearing. Her eyes lit up, and she leaned in close to me. Want to hear a real doozy? She asked. She tells me about how when she first started, there was a case that had got a lot of attention in the media. A family had been out berry picking in an area of the forest very close to the entrance of the park. They had two little boys, both under the age of five. And at some point during the day, one of them vanishes. There's an absolute massive search and they find absolutely nothing. It's another of those cases where it's like the kid was never there in the first place. The dogs just sit down and don't pick up on anything, and no trace of the kid is found. The search goes on for about two months, but is eventually called off. Fast forward to six months later. The family comes back to place flowers at a memorial that's been set up there for the kid. They bring their other son. While they're placing the flowers, they lose sight of the kid for about three seconds, and in that span of time, he vanishes into thin air. Now obviously, the parents are beyond devastated. It's awful enough to lose one child, but to lose two is beyond imagining. The search is huge, one of the largest in state history. There are about 300 volunteers combing every inch of this park looking for the kid. But again, there's no trace of him. The search goes on for about a week, with people looking miles from the part of the park he vanished from. And then, almost two weeks later, a volunteer almost 15 miles from the designated search area radios in that he's found the kid. They assume that the kid was dead, but the volunteer says that he's not only alive, he's in good shape. Katie and her team go out to recover the kid, and when they get there, she can't believe that this is the kid that's been missing. His clothes are clean, there's no dirt on him anywhere, and he doesn't appear to be traumatized. The volunteer says he found the kid sitting on a log, playing with a little twig bundle that's bound together with some old rope. Katie asks him where he's been, who he was with for those two weeks, and the kid tells her that he's been with the Fuzzy Man. Now Katie firmly believes in Bigfoot, so she gets all excited and asks what he means by fuzzy. Was he hairy? But the kid says no, he wasn't hairy. He was a fuzzy man, and he describes a man that's blurry, like when you close your eyes, but not all the way closed. He says the man came out of the trees and took the kid with him deep into the woods. The kid says he slept in a hollow tree, and the fuzzy man gave him berries to eat. KD asks if the man was mean, if he scared the kid, and the kid says, no, he wasn't scary, but I didn't like how he didn't have eyes. KD says they get the kid back to headquarters, and a cop takes him into town to talk to him more about what happened. She's friends with the cop that talked to him, and she said the kid described being kept in this tree by the fuzzy man and given berries whenever he was hungry. He was allowed to wander around a very specific clearing, but when he tried to go further, the fuzzy man would get mad and yell real loud, even though he didn't have a mouth. When the kid got scared at night, the fuzzy man made it go brighter and gave him the twig bundle. He said the fuzzy man was going to keep him, but he had to let him go because the kid wasn't the right kind. He either can't or won't elaborate more on that. The cops are just sort of left scratching their heads, and the search for his brother is renewed with no results. The kid has no idea where his brother might be, and they never find him. The last story that Katie told me was of something that happened to her when she got separated from her training group when she was a rookie. They were learning the basics of high elevation belaying on a well-mapped side of the mountain, and she had to use the bathroom. She went off about 50 yards from the group during a meal break 
and did her business. I'll tell the rest exactly as she told it to me. So I go to take a piss, and once I'm done, I start going back to the group. But I've only gotten about five feet when I realize that I have no idea where I am. And this wasn't like a, oh, I got turned around lost. I mean, I had literally no fucking clue where I was. If you'd asked me, I don't even think I could be able to tell you what state we were in. It was sort of how I imagine people with amnesia feel, you know? You're completely lost, and you have no idea what to do. So I stood there for a while, just trying to figure out where the fuck I was and what I was supposed to do. But the longer I stand there, the more confused and turned around I get. So I started walking. As I recall, I just picked a random direction and went for it. And as I'm walking, I'm just getting worse and worse to the point where I have no concept of why I'm on the mountain in the first place. I'm just trudging through snow. And then I start hearing this voice. It's kind of inside my head, almost. Like if a frog could talk all low and croaky. And it's telling me over and over, it's okay, it's okay. You just need to find something to eat. Find something to eat and you'll be okay. Just keep walking and find something to eat. 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 So I start looking around for anything that I can eat. And I swear to God, I've never felt that hungry in my entire life. It was bottomless. And I think I'd have eaten just about anything you put in front of me right then. I had no concept of time, so I had no idea how long I'd been out there when I hear an actual voice coming towards me. I go toward it and see one of the other SARs, and he looks fucking terrified. He's running toward me, asking if I'm okay and what the hell I'm doing out here. And the scary thing was, as he's running toward me, I kind of see myself reaching into my belt for my hunting knife. I'm not even really thinking about what I'm doing, but what I am thinking is that I have to eat. If I don't eat, I'll never be okay again. So I just have to eat. He sees me doing that and he backs off right away. He yells at me to put my knife away, that he's not gonna hurt me. And that kind of snaps me back. All of a sudden, I know exactly where I am and I put the knife away. I run to him and ask him how long I've been gone thinking he'll tell me I've been gone for half an hour or so. But he tells me I've been gone for two fucking days. I've gone over two peaks and ended up almost on the other side of the mountain. And if I'd kept going, I would have ended up wandering into about 300 miles of wilderness. They'd never have found me. He can't believe I'm not dead, and of course, I don't know what the fuck to think. To me, no time has passed at all. I don't say anything. I just go back with him to a rendezvous point, and I'm taken back to HQ to be airlifted to the hospital. When I get there, they do all kinds of tests and try to figure out what happened. As best as they can guess, I had some kind of weird fugue state, which is kind of like amnesia or a weird seizure that knocked my brain out of whack. But the truth is that we really don't know. This never happened again. But I'll tell you, ever since then, I never go out there alone. People rag on me for making them come with me when I have to leave the group. But I just tell them that listening to me piss in the snow is better than losing me for two fucking days on a freezing mountain. The next person I talked to was E.W., a former trainer who now works as an EMT. He still comes to ops like this to help out, but doesn't work full time for us anymore. He specialized in finding lost kids. He just seemed to have a sixth sense when it came to knowing where they'd gone. He's a legend among the more senior vets, but he gets embarrassed if you compliment him on his work. He sat down with me at dinner one evening, and we ended up swapping stories. Most of them were just casual, but when we got on the subject of our weirder calls, I mentioned that I had a buddy who'd gone up a set of stairs. He got kind of quiet and asked me if I'd heard of a little boy who disappeared from his park a few years back. I hadn't, so he told me this story. They were out looking for this 11-year-old boy, Joey, who'd gone missing near a river. Of course, the first thought was that he'd fallen in and drowned. But when they brought dogs out, they led SAR officers away from the river and up to a very densely forested area. When we do searches for people, we search in a grid pattern, and we search every box of the grid incredibly thoroughly. What EW's team noticed right away was that a very strange pattern was emerging. 
Dogs in alternating boxes were picking up Joey's scent, but losing it when they overlapped with another box. If you think of a checkerboard, Joey's scent was being picked up in random black squares, but never in red. This, of course, didn't make any sense, because how could the kid bounce from area to area without leaving a scent in each place he passed? E.W. and his partner pass into a new box of the grid, and E.W. notices a set of stairs about 50 yards away. He tells his partner that they need to go check near it, but his partner flat out refuses. He tells E.W. that he's made it a point never to go near any stairs he sees, and that while it may be routine, he's not to pretend that it's normal. He tells E.W. that he'll wait in sight while E.W. checks. E.W. says he was irritated, but he felt for the guy and didn't push him on the subject. I walked over to the stairs. They were small, kind of like stairs into a basement. I don't really feel strongly one way or another about them, the stairs I mean, so I wasn't scared or anything. I guess I'm like everyone else, and I just prefer not to think about them too much. Anyway, I went over and I could see that there was something lying on the bottom step, sort of curled up. My heart sinks, because of course, you always hope for the best. And we were confident that we'd find this kid alive, because he'd only been missing for a few hours. But I knew right away that it was him, and that he was dead. He was curled up in a little ball on the step, holding his stomach. It looked like he'd been in horrible pain when he died, but I didn't see any blood, except some on his lips and chin. I radioed in that I found him, and we got his body back to command. That poor family. They were devastated. The parents couldn't understand how he'd be dead, because he'd only been gone for such a short amount of time. And on top of that, we didn't have any obvious case of death, which just made it worse. I figured he'd probably eaten something poisonous since he was holding his stomach when I found him, but I didn't want to guess. It's hard enough to hear that your kid is dead, let alone have some stupid SAR guy guessing about what happened. They took him away, and I went home and tried not to think about it. I hate finding dead kids, man. I loved this job, but it's one of the reasons I left. I've got two daughters, and the thought of losing them that way just... He choked up a little here. I'm not great with emotional stuff like that, and it's always sort of awkward to see a grown man cry, so I didn't really know what to do. He pulled himself together eventually, though, and he kept going. We don't always hear back from the coroners about cause of death. It's not really our job to know, I guess. And sometimes, if they think it's foul play, they won't tell us because of legal bullshit. But I've got a friend who works for the sheriff's department, and he'll usually pass along any interesting info if I ask. In this case, though, I actually got a call from him about a week later. He asks if I remember the kid, and of course I do. And he says some seriously weird shit is going on. He tells me, E.W., man, you're going to think I'm crazy, but the coroner has no idea what happened to this kid. He's never seen anything like it. My friend goes on to tell me that when the coroner opened the kid up, he couldn't even believe what he was seeing. The kid's organs were like Swiss cheese. Quarter-sized holes were punched clean through just about every single organ this kid had, aside from his heart and lungs. But his colon his stomach, his kidneys, and even one of his testicles were full of these clean holes. My friend said the coroner described it as if someone had taken a hole punch and punched holes out of everything. They were so neat. But the kid didn't have a scratch on him, no entry or exit wounds. The closest anyone there had ever seen like it was a guy who filled himself full of buckshot a year or so back while cleaning his rifle. No one had a clue what could possibly have caused it. My friend asked me if I'd ever heard of anything like it, or if we'd had similar cases in the past. But I had never even heard of something like that, and I told him I wasn't going to be of any help to him. As far as I know, the coroner determined the cause of death as something like massive internal bleeding, but no one knows what really happened. I've never been able to forget that kid. I have nightmares about it sometimes. I don't let my kids go into the woods alone, and when we go together, I never let them out of my sight. I used to love it out here, but that case and a couple others just sort of ruined it for me.
Dinner was over, so we started to clean up and go back to our cabins. Before we went our separate ways, he put his hand on my shoulder and looked at me really close. He tells me that there are bad things out here. Things that don't care if we have families or lives, or that we can think and feel. He tells me to be careful, and he walks away. I didn't get a chance to talk with him again, but that story stuck with me. By pure coincidence, I got to talk to another vet, PB, who's been in the SAR field for years. We were partnered on a grid sweep during a training exercise, and we were chatting casually about how we liked the job, what kinds of things we'd seen, and the like. At one point, we passed an old set of stairs, though these were probably from an old fire lookout, given the area that we were in. I sort of casually mentioned that I was curious about the stairs, and that I wished I knew more about them. He got kind of quiet and looked like he wanted to tell me something, but wasn't sure if he should. Finally, he told me to turn my radio off. Obviously, this is something we are never, ever supposed to do, but I did it, and he did the same. About seven years ago, he tells me, he was out on a call with a rookie. They were in an area of the park that's had a lot of strange reports and events, disappearances, stories about lights in the forest, odd noises, things like that. The rookie was totally spooked, kept going on about things in the woods. According to PB, the guy wouldn't stop talking about the goat man, just on and on, goat man this and goat man that. Finally, I told him that there was plenty else to be afraid of out here that was very real, and that he'd better get over this thing with the goat man. The rookie wanted to know what kinds of things I was talking about, and I just told him to shut up and walk. We crested a little ridge, and there was a staircase about 10 yards ahead. The rookie stops dead in his tracks and just stands there looking at them. I tell him, see, that's something you should be afraid of. The rookie asks me what the hell these are doing out here, and for some reason, I just open up and tell him the truth, or what I've been told is the truth. I could have gotten into a lot of trouble for doing what I did, and I could get in a lot of trouble for repeating it to you. But you're a nice kid, and I want you to stop looking into this quit while you're ahead. So I'll tell you what I know, under the condition that you never breathe a word of this to the suits. I told him I wouldn't say a word, and he double checks that our radios are off. When I first started out, we were a little less tight-lipped about them, and other things that happened out here. We warned people before they were even hired that there was weird shit going on. I guess the Forest Service was tired of having such a massive turnover rate and they wanted people to know what they were getting into. So they started having people sign these agreements that they wouldn't go to the media about what they were going to see. The FS didn't want to scare people away, so the last thing they needed were spooked rookies running off to the media with stories of ghosts and haunted stairs. But eventually, they found that the agreements weren't necessary. People not only didn't want to talk about what they saw, they wouldn't. A few times, Media tried to talk to people when kids or hikers would disappear, and no one would say a word. I can't really explain it. I guess we just don't really want to admit anything is wrong. This is our job, to be out in the woods every single day. We don't need to be spooked, and the best way to avoid that is to pretend like everything's okay. So I'll tell you everything I can think of, and after that, I'm done talking about it for good and I expect you to not bring it up around me, ever. The stairs have been out here for as long as the parks have existed. We have records going back decades describing them. Some people go up them and nothing happens. Other times, look, I, I really don't like talking about this, but sometimes really bad shit happens. I saw one guy get his hand sliced clean off when he got to the top step. He reached out to touch a tree branch and it happened so fast. One second his hand was there, the next it was gone. Completely clean wound. We didn't find his hand, and the guy almost died. Another time, a woman touched one of the stairs, and a blood vessel in her brain exploded. Literally exploded, like a water balloon. She sort of stumbled down and came over to me, and all she got out was, I think something is wrong with me. She dropped like a sack of flour, dead before she hit the ground. I'll never forget the way the blood leaked into the inside of her eye. 
Before she died, I watched it turn red. I watched it happen and there wasn't a single thing I could do to help. We warn people not to go anywhere near them, but there's always at least one idiot who does. And even if nothing happens to them, something bad always happens. Kids go missing as we're on their trail. Someone dies the next day, cut in half in a completely safe part of the park. I don't know why, but something bad always happens. I don't know exactly why they're out here, but it doesn't matter, they're here. And if we're smart, we tell our new officers exactly what they're capable of. We were both quiet for a little while. I was afraid to talk because I wasn't sure if he was done. He looked like he wanted to say something else. Finally, he spoke up again. Have you ever noticed how you can't find the same ones twice? I nodded, expecting him to continue. But he just stayed quiet, walking alongside me. And eventually he started a story about the biggest deer he'd ever seen in the park. I didn't bring up the subject again, and I didn't press him for any more stories. He dropped out of the op the next day. Apparently, he left before the sun came up, said he was sick. None of us have heard from him since he left. I'm going to stop here for the time being. I'll try and post the next part in the coming days, but with it being the end of summer, things are pretty busy here. Thanks for the continued interest, guys. You've really awakened this curiosity in me that I didn't even know I had. Hey everybody, this is Winter Freshest. I just wanted to say thank you for taking time out of your day to watch one of my videos. If you enjoy my videos, feel free to like and subscribe. Also, if you have any requests for other narrations, please comment down below. Thanks again, everyone.